wonderful life, full and complete, with the great loves and great works that make it worth living. I am sad to leave, but I leave with the knowledge that I lived the life that I intended. Best wishes, Charles. If I didn't write, if I didn't do what I do, if I didn't do commentary, if I didn't play whatever minor role I play in the history of this time, uh, I would feel that I had failed in life. I hadn't done what I could do. But I'm very lucky to have stumbled upon what I was meant to do. I love it and I think it's important. Thanks, Maxine. That's really going to help solve the problem. That video, of course, surfacing this afternoon from an event yesterday. Evening, everyone. Welcome to The Next Revolution. I'm Steve Hilton, and this is the home of positive populism. Tammy Bruce is with us on the panel tonight to weigh in on the rising rage over immigration and how it's shifting attention further away from policy and real solutions. But first, here's my take. Immigration will always be an emotional issue. It certainly is for me. My parents were refugees from communism in Hungary, and now I'm an immigrant here in America. I've been detained at the US border because of a problem with my documents, and even with all my advantages. It was one of the most frightening experiences of my life. Worse than that, another time, our family was detained, and my eldest son separated. That was for, what, 45 minutes? Again, with all our advantages, this is nothing compared to what others are going through but we still remember that trauma today. Look, the way to make sure that we treat everyone humanely is not yelling and screaming and calling people Nazis. It is well-designed and competently executed policy. So let's apply some logic. The emerging view on the left is that the most humane policy is just to say yes to everyone at the border. They're fleeing terrible violence, looking for a better life. Just let them in. But how humane is that really? First of all, it privileges those who actually get to the border, the survival of the fittest. There are over 60 million refugees across the world, and that number will only increase. A humane immigration and asylum policy wouldn't just take the first people who show up, but those in most need. What about when they get here? There are economic consequences. As Bernie Sanders said, open borders would, quote, make everybody in America poorer. You're doing away with the concept of a nation state, bring in all kinds of people, work for two or three dollars an hour. I don't believe in that. I think we have to raise wages in this country. There are social consequences too. Barack Obama talked about his, quote, patriotic resentment at seeing Mexican flags at pro-immigration events, saying he was not immune to what he called nativist sentiment. When I'm forced to use a translator, he said, to communicate with the guy fixing my car, I feel a certain frustration. Open borders means more pressure on public services like schools and hospitals. Democrat Senator Dianne Feinstein once raged about the proportion of California's health budget being spent on the births of illegal immigrants' babies. What about crime? If we waved everyone through on humanitarian grounds, we can argue about the exact proportion who would end up committing violent crimes, but nobody can say that none would. Just ask Kate Steinle's family about the humanity of that. And then what about the consequences for immigrants themselves? As National Review editor Rehan Salam recently argued, we now have not just an immigration crisis, but an integration crisis. 10, 20 years after coming here, immigrants are living in poverty, in his words, being ghettoized and racialized instead of living the American dream. How is that humane? Logic tells us you have to control immigration and asylum somehow. The minute you accept that, you get into the really tough questions. Who should we welcome and who should we turn away? Turning anyone away is hard, but as we've seen, failing to do so is inhumane as well. The reason emotions are running so high over immigration is that successive administrations lost control of it. 
America is an opening and welcoming country, but public consent for immigration depends on government control of immigration. That's why this administration is right to try and impose order at the border. But the way they did it, frankly, was shambolic. President Trump ordered a new policy that is right and popular. Zero tolerance for illegal immigration. How can anyone, especially the Democrats and never Trump Republicans who are constantly screaming about President Trump undermining the rule of law, honestly be against zero tolerance for illegal immigration? But the consequence of that policy arising from prior legal rulings was wrong and unpopular. Family separation. It could and should have been predicted and planned for by the administration. Here's John Kelly over a year ago when he was still Homeland Security Secretary. Are you, the Department of Homeland Security, considering a new, a new initiative that would separate children from their parents if they try to enter the United States illegally? Uh, let me start by saying I would do almost anything to deter uh, the people from Central America uh, uh, to getting on this very, very dangerous network that brings them up through Mexico into the United States. Yes, I am considering in order to deter uh, more movement along this terribly dangerous network, I am considering uh, exactly that. They will be well cared for as we deal with their parents. Look, I hate the anti-Trump brigade self-righteous moral preening as much as anyone. I'm disgusted by the way Chuck Schumer this week clearly showed he'd rather play politics with this issue than solve the problem. But the fact remains that this administration is in charge now. John Kelly, in particular, needs to get his act together. He seems totally out of his depth as White House Chief of Staff. We need a big, urgent, whole government response, and it's the Chief of Staff's job to organize it. At the heart of it should be something this president knows all about. Donald Trump is a builder, so let's get building. Asylum and immigration centers in El Salvador and Honduras and Guatemala, so there's no need to come to the border in the first place. For those who do come, build proper facilities so people can be handled quickly, firmly and humanely. And of course, build the wall to stop those dangerous illegal border crossings. Zero tolerance plus maximum competence. That's the humane response to the border crisis. That's the next revolution we need. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at NextRevFNC and at Steve Hilton X and tell us what you think. With us here in Los Angeles tonight, senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, Shelby Steele. Former Bernie Sanders national staffer, Teslin Figaro. And joining us from New York, Fox News contributor and president of Independent Women's Voice, Tammy Bruce. Tammy, yeah. let me start with you. you you've sure. got some really interesting um, points here right, that, that I've heard you make about how this whole crisis really reflects the failure of the establishment on all sides. I'd love to hear you explain your thinking on that. Well, look, uh, there's this sense that this border chaos is just somehow come, uh, you know, out of on its own organically. But we do have a government. Uh, it is uh, this uh, border issue. Immigration has been discussed for generations. And yet somehow they can never get it right. Uh, and I don't mm -hmm. think it's because they just don't know what to do or, or they're just too busy. I think it's because the chaos serves uh, effectively the purpose of the establishment, where uh, the people pour into the country for the establishment. It's about, I think also to some degree, of course, it's about votes. Uh, it's about for, uh, uh, business. It is about low uh, wage uh, uh, workers, effectively a new slave class that comes in. And it, it serves for both sides, both the Republicans and the Democrats to a degree, an argument uh, that raises money during elections uh, that you can use mm -hmm. uh, to uh, as a wedge for framework uh, to demonize uh, other groups as well. And, and I think that this is the government's issue in general. I don't, I don't think it's a one politician. I think that this is how the establishment has worked. It's like uh, when uh, the Republicans were suddenly surprised that you had a Republican in the White House and we wanted them to actually repeal and replace Obamacare which is what they had, uh, had, had campaigned on for years, uh, taking our votes and our money, and then looked shocked, like we, uh, we expected them to actually do it. So a lot of this is rhetoric for them. They really don't want to uh, change it, and I think that's why we've seen it, uh, uh, the status quo and, and stagnant like this uh, for so long. I think that's such a deep point, Tammy. It's about the incentives here just to, to fix it, and they're, and they're basically not there with the establishment. Correct. Tessa, I'd like to get your take. Um, look, I know you don't speak for the Democratic Party, 
Um, but, but, you know, you're in touch with them more than anyone else here, I suspect. <laughs> They're my friends. So, to, to, beyond the outrage, what is the Democrat policy on immigration and asylum? You know, I think what the policy now is just to try to get um, President Trump to take accountability for what's going on right now. I think you made an interesting point with, especially with you being an immigrant, to talk about what it was like being separated from your kids. You know, I think once we start talking about separating children, now, you know, we've reached a, a new level of low. And so I, I can't really answer on what the policy is. It seems now, right now, the policy is just a bunch of yelling and screaming. But I think Tammy brings a good point. You bring a good point. Right now, the, the administration is in charge now needs to fix it. Something needs to happen. There, there has to be some type of control, but at the same time, we also have to be able to protect these children. You know, but I keep getting in trouble, Steve, for saying the same thing over and over when we talk about domestic issues. You mm -hmm. know, I'm from Houston, Texas. There's still children, black and brown children, who are sleeping on cement floors from Hurricane Harvey with exposed electric outlets, exposed, you know, exposed to all the hazards um, of the community, and nothing's being said about that. So when you right. talked about President Obama's resentment and the type of resentment that people like me feel, a lot of domestic issues are also being ignored. So as we figure out what we do with people who want to come into this country, mm -hmm. I hope we can also figure out what to do with people who are already in this country and born in this country and to provide them some also humane conditions as well. Well, I mean, look, that is that is really good point. Well said, but that is definitely not what you... It feels like the Democrats right now, if you look at what really fires them up, if you look at the response to the travel ban and now this, it isn't actually the conditions of people living in America. Mm -hmm. That's not what fires up the Democratic Party these days. That's what it seems to me, right? No, I mean, it's, it's absolutely. Well, the squeaky wheel gets the, gets the oil. And what I've found is, and, and I've talked about this before in organizing while black, um, black people have been screaming and shouting and swinging and, you know, for a very long time. So a lot of people in my community and our issues have been somewhat pushed to the side and not to say that they're not black immigrants because they there are. Um, we talk about Haitians, but you rarely hear about them. You rarely hear about Nigerians as well. Well, but because the immigrant community is very involved, very organized, that is what Democrat politicians mm -hmm. are going to pay attention to because those are their donors. Those are the ones that are are you know making the making the claim, you know, putting the, the money, the resource into the politicians' hands, and and putting them in or out of office. I would love to see other groups as well, you know, hold politicians just as accountable for immigrant issues. Um, again, I've been in trouble many times right. for coming on Fox speaking about these issues, and I am not anti-immigrant, I'm, but I'm also pro-American as well, and I wish we could find sometimes. Type of balance. Well, I think a lot sides. of people are, 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 are praying for that. But Shelby, you know, you've, you've made your, uh, you know, your academic career. You've focused on these issues of race and culture. How does how does this play into your uh, your study of that? And what's your take on the present moment on this very hot issue? Well, I think the what explains the democratic fascination with, with this this whole immigration issue is that they smell power in it. Um, and then their strategy, as is very often their strategy, is to put a moral framework around immigration so that it becomes an issue of good versus evil, of guilt versus innocence. And if you're on the innocent side, uh, you know, then, then you're a, a, a good Democrat. If, if you have qualifications, it's the slightest qualm about something, then you are you are associated with America's history of evil, of racism, sexism, and so forth. And you're the kind of person who's using uh, this issue mm -hmm. as a pretext for that old agenda, bringing back that old America. Well, that's a broad framework, but I think, I think we can't discuss immigration because that, that moral moralizing of it uh, gives me a whole set of incentives that really aren't there. So I, I don't look at the issue anymore. I don't look at, mm. because I think the fact is that immigration is rather, could be rather easily dealt with if we, if we could clear away this, this moral battle so, we have. Uh, it's, it's not hard to, you, you know, you, the, the paper that, uh, that you wrote, did a perfectly good job of, of showing how that might That's be such done. A, I, I thank you for that. I thought that was such a, a wise way of explaining what's going on. Tammy, quick mm. final word to you. That, that really struck a chord with me, what Shelby just said. Yes, and you know what else it does is it helps, it raises money. That fake Time magazine cover featuring a little girl's picture taken out of context uh, saying that she had been separated from her mother, which was not the case. It was not that context at all. But it raised about $17 million 
for a, 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 an immigrants' rights group based on the emotion that's attached to that. And this is also about mm -hmm. big government, right? I mean, this is about manipulating people emotionally. And this is why people got were shocked when the Democrats didn't want to move on Dreamer legislation that the president wanted. President Trump, in the midst of this, interestingly, is the outsider who wants specific solutions and quickly. He's a man of action. And he's, he's, he's come into this, this tornado of people who really don't want to do anything and just want people to be distracted by saying, we want the wall, we want legal immigration, the, the border needs to be controlled. And you, you've got mm -hmm. a, a, adults who are being arrested, and then you, they do have children with them. So the question becomes, well, wh what do you do with those children? And the answer for the Democrats has been catch and release. And this is the argument about right. they want to go back to that. But the president wants something larger. He wants it legislatively and he wants it permanent so that everyone knows what the rules are so that we can move on in this country and, and continue to improve everyone's lives. Tammy, thank you so much for that. Uh, we're going to keep talking about this. Coming up, could all the rage against President Trump and his supporters actually make them more loyal to him? A surprising source, The New York Times, says yes. The full story, next. Welcome back, everyone. By now, you've all heard about Press Secretary Sarah Sanders being asked to leave a restaurant, and DHS Secretary Kirsten Nielsen shouted out of another establishment. But are all these attacks against the president only serving to strengthen his supporters' resolve? Listen to this from a front-page story in today's New York Times. Quote, in interviews across the country over the last few days, dozens of Trump voters, as well as pollsters and strategists, describe something like a bonding experience with the president that happens each time Republicans have to answer a now familiar question. How can you possibly still support this man? Their resilience suggests a level of unity among Republicans that could help mitigate Mr. Trump's low approval ratings and aid his party's chances of keeping control in the House of Representatives in November. Tammy and Tesla and Shelby are still with us. Um, Shelby, let me start with you. This is just such an interesting psychological phenomenon that seems mm -hmm. to be going on here, which is the more that the, the critics get enraged, the more they drive people towards President Trump. Right. Um, I think one of the reasons for that, there are probably many, but one of them is the fact that when you moralize a problem, it becomes, it's not, no longer in the realm of, of reason. It becomes about identity. Mm -hmm. and, and so you, you, uh, you now have insulted these, these uh, Trump uh, uh, supporters and they're, they're going to come back. They're going to say, now you're, you're going too far. You're, you're transgressing my, who I am as a moral human being. And um, so they, they then, Trump benefits from that little, right. that blowback, uh, as, as it were. That's the second, that word moralizing, it's really important. It's, it's mm -hmm. really crucial to what's going on here. Tell me, there's, there's some brilliant quotes in this piece. Uh, this, is, this is a, a suburban uh, mom from uh, Loudoun County, Virginia. It's exactly the kind of people that they say Trump is losing with this kind of um, at, uh, policy on the border. This is a quote. It makes me, this is talking about the attacks on President Trump. It makes me angry at them which causes me to want to defend him to them even more. It's so interesting. Well, it is. And, and yet the main mistake, I think, in the New York Times take here is that it's not about digging in to support a man who's being attacked. It is about a defense, uh, as Shelby noted, of ourselves. But within the framework of noticing mm -hmm. that the behavior of the left and of liberals in this kind of regard confirms the nature of who they are. Uh, that it's frightening to, to see this kind of uh, effectively mass hysteria, especially since now it's been a bit over 500 days. We've learned that President Trump has uh, likes to govern. He, he's kept his promises. Things have gotten better. Uh, that he's, do he's doing what we wanted him to do as a businessman. He is definitely a disruptor. And, and yet things are better. Wages are higher. People have more money in their paychecks. Unemployment at, his, at the historic lows for everyone across the board. So when you, when you see this madness, if you will, also um, Pam Biondi in, in, in Florida was chased out of a movie theater. You, you see this dangerous kind of framework. And about a year mm -hmm. ago, by the way, Steve, is when uh, that guy tried to kill 23 Republicans at the baseball field. So we know right. that there's, th this is dangerous. And I think that this pushback is less about a, a slavish devotion to Donald Trump. 
and more of a confirmation that we were right in November, that the other side is turning into a, a, a dangerous framework, and that the, the, supporting the president is, in fact, supporting what we wanted, which is policy, progression on the issues, a, a stronger economy, and a safer world. That's what we're digging in on. Uh, and they're making a mistake to think it's all about Donald Trump. It's also beyond his supporters. It, straight, uh, he, th this is pushing people up in uh, uh, purple counties to support the president. The New York Times noted that it's people who are college educated. They see it across the board in support increasing for the president. So Americans in general do not like what they're seeing. And I think uh, Democrats would do very well in uh, realizing that, that it's not Trump's fault. It's their behavior that Americans are rejecting. Interesting. So, Tessan, do you get any sense of that on the left, that, that there's a, a, a feeling that this is just going over the top? Oh, I mean, get a feeling of it. I've personally experienced it myself. You know, we see it even happening on the left. The more people that are against Bernie Sanders, the mm -hmm. more people are going to support Bernie Sanders. The more people that are oh, against right. Hillary Clinton, Same. the more, you know, the never Sanders. The ne that just infuels, you know, more people. But even myself, um, no matter how many times I've said I'm independent, I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, how many times I've been on Fox supporting black issues, I've been called a racist, I've been called a bigot um, from the left. You know, uh, clients have been asked to detach themselves from from me. Um, so it, it's not just happening with Sarah. It's not just happening with people who are, um, you know, resilient to support uh, President Trump. But just like what she mentioned, even people like myself, the more you tell me to shut up and not assert my First Amendment right, the more resilient I'm going to be about it. You tell me not to go on Fox, guess what I'll be doing? Going back on Fox. <laughs> so you, you, will see this, to yeah, see you, you will exactly. see this type of behavior continue because it is about people trying to take away people's right to have freedom of speech, to have different opinions, to have diverse opinions where we can all, you know, disagree and agree on policies that make sense. And the more of that, the more hate, the more anger, the more frustration without actually hearing people's ideas, sitting down, want, you know, side by side, hearing other Americans and how they feel, the more hate it will be. And I really, to be honest with you, I don't know where that's, what that's going to turn into yeah. 2020. Yeah. But even Barack Obama said being anti-Trump will not be enough. You will have to focus on policy if you want to see President Trump out of office. Shelby? Good for you. I went through that 30 years ago. Mm. Uh, when I began to write about race and I began to question the, the orthodoxy of the civil rights movement and uh, the, way, the way race was, as an issue was evolving in American life. And um, myself and a few other people who've now been sort of permanently labeled black conservatives, mm. uh, my friend Thomas Sowell says if we can, if we have our yearly conference, we can have it in a phone booth. <laughs> uh, there weren't many of us. Uh, there weren't many of us, and uh, we, we, we went through this. Just know that you're absolutely right. Uh, it's, it, it, what's important for, for blacks, for, for America, is for you to be an individual. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you're going to just represent you know, the party line of the group, then the group doesn't grow, nobody benefits. So I'm really happy and proud to, to uh, see you take that position, and your suffering will pass. Oh, I appreciate that. I, well, I do. I, Go ahead. No, no, I, we've got to leave it there, but okay. I just really appreciate the discussion. Thank, yeah. Thanks to both of Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Republican John Cox got a big endorsement from Donald Trump in the primary for California governor and went on to do much better than anyone expected. He joins me live next. Welcome back. After eight long years of Governor Jerry Brown, the state of California is set to elect a new governor this November. With me now is one of the two men vying for the job, Republican John Cox. John, it's so great to see you here. Normally, I think you. the audience will be very familiar with you because you're on the channel, but it's so great you're live here in Los Angeles. I love being here. That's great. Thank you. It's fantastic to see you. Um, I've got to start by asking you just ab about that race. So many people were going around saying, well, the Republicans are going to be locked out. Right, Gavin right. Newsom, the Democrat frontrunner, he's going to run yeah. away with it. And then this, the former mayor of L.A., Via Rogosa, is going to be right. number two. No one really gave you a chance. But you, not, you didn't just get into the final two. You really crushed it. What happened? Well, I, I, I love being the experts. I mean, the experts were all about Mr. Via Rogosa, And, of course, those same experts now are saying that Mr. Newsom is going to waltz into the uh, governor's mansion, which, yes. of course, he's not. And the reason he's By not... By the way, he actually said that himself. He said, well, I really want to face... 
John Cox because <laughs> I can crush him. Well, I don't think that's going to happen. I'll tell you why. It's because the Democrats, and, and especially Gavin Newsom, have mismanaged this state. The special interests in Sacramento control him. Uh, he's a walking, talking special interest. Uh, he is defending the gas tax, mm -hmm. which is driving gasoline prices up to five dollars a gallon, uh, close to that in this state. Uh, that is really hurting the forgotten Californians in California, the people, the working people of this state. Steve, the California dream is now the dream of moving to Texas. Right. And I want to restore that California dream. I want to make this state affordable. Gavin Newsom is going to have to defend the last eight years where this state has the highest poverty rate in the nation. Mm -hmm. The cost of housing has gone out of sight. The roads are in horrible shape. Our schools, we spend $80 billion a year now, uh, close to it, and we're now 45th or so in the nation. Uh, we're now being told that we can't use as much water uh, because we haven't built reservoirs. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the, the, the special interests are just running wild, uh, driving up the cost of uh, government and driving up the cost for average Californians. And, and, you know and I think they've had enough. And what's interesting for our audience watching anywhere in America is that this is being pitched as the model for the whole country oh, by the Democrats. That's right. That's what they're talking about, isn't it? Well, you know what, Steve? Uh, I have said that this race is going to be national because people are going to pay attention to this. You know, Gavin Newsom is determined to be the resistance to Donald Trump. Well, you know what? I'm going to be the resistance to that resistance. Right. Uh, the idea that we need to get this state to work against. We need to manage this state better. I think that's a lot of what President Trump is trying to accomplish in, in, in D.C. And, you know, he's cutting taxes, he's cutting regulations. And, you know, the cronies, the special interests, you know, they don't like that. You know, they want their little yeah. kingdoms kept in place. And, so look, and, I just, and he's fighting I, in, that. In a second, I'm, I'm going to bring Tammy in from New York. But I just want yeah. to get your quick comment on this immigration issue because it's so yeah. such a big issue for California. Right. What's your thought? Well, on I think it's kind of horrendous, that? first of all, to separate parents and children. I mean, I think I agree with you on the fact that that was probably not well thought out. Uh, I'm a Jack Kemp Republican. Uh, I was on his presidential steering committee. I welcome legal immigration. I love the fact that America is this beacon of hope for people all around the world that want to come here legally. I don't know what we say to people who have been waiting in line for years to come to America, and then you have people who are basically coming up from these horrendous uh, you know, uh, nations like El Salvador and Honduras where there's just horrendous conditions. I feel for these people. Uh, let's try to see what we can do about, you know, those conditions. Uh, but we, we have to have laws. We have to have an immigration law mm -hmm. that's, that's adhered to or else people around the world aren't going to respect us. And, and like I said, there's people around the world who are waiting to come to this country. Eastern Europe, where your family came mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people there that are waiting to come to America. We need to have an orderly legal process. But yeah. I welcome people to come to this country. I think country. orderly is, is the word. So, Tammy, let's, yeah. um, John spoke there um, earlier about the national implications of this race. I thought it was really interesting. There was so much talk about the Republicans being completely wiped out in California. It's part of this whole talk about the blue wave and all the rest right. of it. How do you see things in the light of John's, uh, if, if he doesn't mind me saying, surprisingly strong performance well, in was, the primary a few Yeah, weeks that ago. was pretty exciting. Um, and yet at the same time, keep in mind that everyone, uh, Democrats were looking to California as being an example of the blue wave. As we know it, that did not manifest. But even more than that, it was, it was a dismissal of even Californians. Look, I'm a native Californian as well. I moved to New York a few years ago. Uh, so I'm thrilled that John's on the ballot. And this reminds people that this is the state of Reagan. But, but this was a, a, a real pushback against this, this strange idea by Democrats that everybody loved uh, what was happening with, in the Obama years with no money and no jobs and ISIS and catch and release and MS-13, the opioid epidemics, and somehow would not like the reversal of those horrible things that <laughs> right. were happening to society. So we got, jo so John's on the ballot in, in this, uh, uh, the jungle primaries that they have there. I, I think uh, Democrats expected to win both the first and the second slots for certain Senate seats, guaranteeing them, or, or House seats, I should say, guaranteeing them uh, more seats in the House. That did not happen. So, so you've got Californians are, are, are terrific people. They've, they're optimistic, they're romantic, and they're looking around and they're realizing 
that the policies that have been implemented have not only failed the state, but have made it a dangerous place to live in. They want better lives for themselves and their families. And, and perhaps yes. now they, they can say that they've got a, an opportunity and a chance to choose someone who will implement policies that will make everyone's lives better. And that is, of course, usually uh, a Republican. Tell them. It's a quality of life. Uh, Tammy said it all. What politicians should be doing, and I'm a businessman, I'm not a politician, but I, what I've been dedicated in my business life is to getting results. And that's what the people of California want. They are tired of the high cost of gasoline. They're tired of the high cost of housing. They want results. They want a better quality of life. You know, Tammy, you used to live here maybe, but this, this was the golden state. Oh, yeah. And now uh, there was a poll that, that said that, that we're now 50th out of 50 in quality of life. It's horrible. And you know, You're it right. doesn't have to be. We can have affordable housing. We can reduce regulations. We can uh, streamline the approval process. I'm in the building industry. I can build if I can get my approvals fast, if I, can, if I don't have to wade through all the regulations. Yeah. I, can, I can build affordable housing. And you know, that's what people really want. And, and they don't want to pay $5 for gasoline. They want to be able to fill their tank and live their life. And, and I think that's what people are and going to want to leave the state. November. They, they don't want to leave the state. No. There has been this exodus of good people leaving California for other fabulous states, right? I, I love the, I love all of us, but, but you know, if you're a Californian <laughs> and you, you know, moving to Texas is a big deal or moving to Nevada and moving to Arizona, uh, Californians should be able to live in their state comfortably, be able to raise their, their children and to have the same sort of strong future as, as a red state does. We should be able to have future American futures within an American system, as opposed to the, the, the states that are crumbling, the cities that are, I mean, the destruction of Los Angeles and San Francisco, two incredible oh, American cities, oh. is, is unbelievable and should be unacceptable to all of us. I want California to succeed. Uh, and uh, I think now maybe Californians are gonna do what it takes to, to help that she, to make sure that she does. Brilliant. Thank you, Tammy. One thing I think that connects what you were saying earlier, Tammy, about immigration and, and the kind of mm -hmm. message you've got, John, I think is this, and this is what really characterizes this new, this new populism, what we describe as positive populism. It's very practical, pragmatic. It's mm -hmm. not ideological. Is that fix the problems? That's right. why people elected Donald Trump, and mm -hmm. that's why uh, in your uh, campaign you'll be emphasizing that too. Thank Tammy, stand by. We've got a great swamp watch on ethics in uh, the DC swamp uh, coming up, and I'd love to get your reaction to that. So Tammy's going to stay with us. John, it's great to see you. Great to Thank be you with very you. Much. Thank you, Steve. Now, this man is pursuing President Trump over alleged ethics violations with a Trump hotel in Washington, D.C. But how ethical is he? We'll tell you after the break. Now, you may have heard of an effort to charge President Trump with corruption over something called the Emoluments Clause of the Constitution. The accusation is that by allowing foreign officials to patronize the Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C., the president is violating the constitutional ban on payments from foreign governments to federal office holders. But is there an ethical double standard here? Our broken ethics system is this week's Swamp Watch. <laughs> The argument against President Trump is that his company is profiting from foreign leaders spending money at his property in order to exert undue influence on him. The president said he'd donate all profits from foreign leaders staying at his hotels to the Treasury Department. And he's followed through. Just a couple of months ago, he gave $150,000 in profits to the United States Treasury. But look who's behind this effort. One of the organizations pushing this emoluments case is Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, which is headed by Norm Eisen, formerly President Obama's ethics czar. He is zealously pursuing Donald Trump over his hotel, but it would have been nice to have had some of that ethical zeal during the Obama administration. Where was ethics czar Norm Eisen when Hillary Clinton's State Department approved $165 billion worth of commercial arms sales to 20 nations whose governments had given money to the Clinton Foundation? Where was ethics on Norm Eisen when Bill Clinton was paid half a million dollars by a Russian investment bank for a speech he gave while his wife was Secretary of State and approving deals to help Russia? Or when in October 2010, Bill Clinton took $225,000 for a speech he gave in Jamaica that was sponsored in part by the Irish telecom firm Digicel. Only a few weeks earlier, Digicel had applied for grant money from his wife's State Department. Two months after Bill's speech, Digicel received the first installment. 
The chairman of Digicel, by the way, is an Irish billionaire, Dennis O'Brien, a friend of the Clintons who'd previously set up a number of speaking engagements for Bill and donated millions of his own money to the Clinton Foundation. Somehow, ethics czar Norm Eisen wasn't fussed about any of these swampy Clinton schemes. Eisen was also heavily involved in President Obama's executive order that was hailed as the most sweeping ethics reform in history. The order barred former registered lobbyists from working on regulations or contracts that, quote, directly and substantially related to their prior employers. But that executive order had a shocking number of loopholes, including a waiver issued by the Obama administration to one William Lynn, a former lobbyist for defense contractor Raytheon, who was nevertheless appointed Deputy Secretary of Defense. Here's another revolving door loophole. According to a Politico investigation, Marilyn Taverner, who helped craft Obamacare as head of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, left the administration in February 2015 and resurfaced in July as CEO of a health insurer trade group called America's Health Insurance Plans. If that wasn't swampy enough, she also registered as a federal lobbyist. She claimed that she complied with Obama's executive order on ethics because she herself didn't lobby the executive branch directly. She just met with members of Congress and gave advice to her colleagues who could lobby the executive branch directly. It gets worse. Since Eisen and Obama's executive order only related to registered lobbyists, many in the industry simply deregistered from the ethics system and continued to do the same work under different names like strategic advisor, the order was so toothless, they got away with it. There has reportedly never been a single case of criminal enforcement for ignoring the registration requirement for lobbyists. Federal lobbying registration documents estimate that special interests spend roughly $3 billion a year on lobbying and employ just under 10,000 lobbyists. But estimates that include unregistered lobbying put the number closer to $6 billion and 100,000 lobbyists, 10 times as many. So much for the most sweeping ethics reform in history. And now, isn't it convenient for the Washington establishment to distract attention from their own systemic swampiness by targeting the Trump Hotel? The lawyers, the lobbyists, the current and former politicians, and all the hangers-on in the giant cesspit of cronyism that Washington has become. They don't care about ethics. They don't care about the Trump Hotel. That's amateur hour compared to what they get up to. All they care about is protecting their own corrupt business model at your expense. Coming up, Shelby, Tesla and Tammy have been listening and I'd love their thoughts on this week's Swap Watch. That's next. Don't go away. All right, we're back with Shelby, Tesla and Tammy and Swap Watch. Tesla, let's start with you. Ethics in Washington. Uh, like I've always said, democracy is hypocrisy. You know, I'll be the first one to say, even working for Senator Sanders, guess who became a millionaire? Senator Sanders. You know, there was an article po published last week that over the last two years, he's become a millionaire. So even in 2020, he won't be talking about the millionaires and billionaires. He'll just be talking <laughs> about the billionaires. <laughs> so when we talk about, and, and that's not throwing him under the bus, it's just the reality. It is a big so, test. It, yeah, well, <laughs> well, I mean, it's being honest. But when we talk about the swamp, let's talk about the real swamp that you see it on both sides. You see folks on the Republican yes, and Democrat. Right making money on both sides, but it's people like me who are organizers who are really got the mud thrown in our face, who are still looking for unemployment, who are still looking for jobs after working on these campaigns. Meanwhile, politicians are continuing to get rich, and it happens on both sides of the aisle. So certainly not a dig at Senator Sanders, but it is the truth. He's now a millionaire. He went from $176,000 a year to now profiting over a million dollars over the last two it. years in three houses. So it must be nice. Socialism <laughs> pays well. Okay, it shall be what you make of all this. <laughs> Well, I now see why I never went into politics. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, maybe uh, you should have. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I don't. For, from my point of view, where I start from again all, is the, the sort of cultural, social uh, issues. And one of the things that disturbs me that I think is the source of um, a good deal of corruption is that we've evolved in America a to a place where innocence is power. And if you can somehow define the world in a way in which you're innocent and somebody else is, is guilty, um, uh, then you have enormous power because you have moral authority and legitimacy and, and power. The civil rights movement over the last 50 mm -hmm. years, maybe a little more than 50 at this point, has, has been exactly that, has, has uh, used its innocence to sort of 
Yes. Let's find a nice word for it. Shake down uh, is the, well, <laughs> the word. Well, th Tammy, I'm uh, sorry to, uh, to move on, but we, are, we don't have too much time. Tammy, yeah. the swamp. Well, look, um, what you, what, we're, we're looking at a dynamic where now the people in Washington are simply managing the monster. You know, right? There's been no interest in actually governing. And that's why Donald Trump is, is, is so disturbing to people. But as a result, when you're, just, when you're just managing it, you get to the Jonathan Gruber theory of things, where he admitted that with Obamacare, they, just, they looked at the polls, they saw what people wanted to see, and they wanted to save money on their health care. So that's what they said. They had no idea what Obamacare was going to do to people. So instead of saving you $2,300 a year, which was made up, it ends up costing people over 5000 So th it's the same theory, saying what people want to hear instead of actually working on policy and governing. Exactly. And by the way, so that, that, the reason is that that whole process of Obamacare was total, as we've documented on Swamp Watch, totally captured by the industry, by the lobbyists. It's, it's all there. Anyway, thank you so much, uh, Tammy. That was great coming up. My personal memories of Charles Krauthammer.